We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, ACC. I'm Pastor Nate Keeler. I'm from Delaware, from Wilmington, Delaware. You guys all know where Delaware is? Just up, up 95. I was just talking to somebody about this. Delaware it's, is as small of a state it is. It's actually kind of tied with another state, Rhode Island, depending on where the water is, the water levels are. We're like either the smallest or the second smallest, okay? Little known fact. But endless discoveries is our uh, tagline. Endless discoveries. You can come and discover endless discoveries. So come visit sometime. I just did like a full-on promo for Delaware. Come on up. Sometimes I pastor a church called Brandywine Valley Baptist Church. It's a church that uh, Matt, what I used to call, I call Matt O. You guys, I guess, call him Pastor Matt uh, or Matt. Uh, I, I was part of the ministry he was a part of. And as I was kind of leaving that ministry, he and his family were coming and joining you at ACC. And so it's a privilege to be here. Matt and I have shared uh, many conversations. We've been, I've been blessed by him and he, I hope, has been blessed by me. But he did something to me in this series. He decided, you know, I'm going to go on sabbatical. And while I'm gone, Nate, I, can you come and preach on a topic that's probably like the, one of the most avoided topics out there, maybe one of the most politicized topics. So while I'm gone, can you tackle that one? <laughs> I was like, sure, I don't, know what, I don't know what to make of that, whether you're, you know, is this a curse or is this a blessing? Is this like you have so much confidence in me or you're just trying to, you know, get out of town? But when I go on sabbatical next year, I'm already thinking about what subject do I want to ask Pastor Matt to preach on? But I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be a part of this series called Asking for a Friend. A really great title, very important topics, hard topics that you guys have been wrestling with. It's the thorny questions that many of you ask and are thinking about, but often we don't ask, especially in church settings. So today the topic is gender. That's a topic for you, especially in these days, huh? We're going to talk about gender, and the question as it's stated is how many genders are there? Now, I can either answer this question in like three seconds, or it could be a topic we could address in an entire weekend in a forum, which we'll be doing at our church in September, calling, calling it a gender and sexuality forum. And so I'm not going to do either of those. I'm going to do something in between, somewhere around 30 or so minutes, okay? And we're going to address this topic you might be asking something behind this question, questions like, if somebody feels like a boy trapped in a girl's body, how do we feel about that? Should I support them? Should I not support them? What should I say? Or as it's been stated to me, if God made somebody trans, how could it be wrong? Or it might be something like this, if Gender is, bi is, is gender binary like ones and zeros, or is gender more fluid like the changing colors of the sky? Now, of course, as Christians, as people of the book, you consider yourself, if you're a Christian, a person of the book. We believe this Bible is authoritative. It speaks to our lives. God speaks into every area of morality. What is it? that God says, if anything, about gender identity. These are the kinds of questions we want to discover in the next 30 minutes together. I want to pray for us as we go into this critical topic. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you in this place, we, we want to encounter your truth not the lowercase truths maybe in each and every one of us, but the Meta truth, the capital T truth of who you are and what you say about this much debated, much politicized lightning rod issue of gender. 
And so, Lord, help us, help speak through me from your word that we might rightly divide your word and divide the culture in which we find ourselves in today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to give you three lenses through which to view this topic. Now, this is definitely some sermons maybe are just kind of listen and absorb. This is definitely one. If you take notes, like I would definitely encourage you to take notes in this message. Uh, Write it down because I'm going to throw a lot at you over the next 30 minutes, okay? We're going to look at this topic through three lenses, the lens of culture. We're going to look at this through the lens of the Bible or the biblical lens. And then thirdly, we're going to look at this through the relational lens, Now, all three of these are critical because I believe if we are going to stand on truth, if we're going to stand on conviction, we also need to stand on compassion. We need to stand where Jesus stands on all things. And in order to do that, we need to be able to see through all three of these lenses. Now, the biblical lens is foundational. We can't discern, rightly divide, and discern culture apart from a proper biblical lens, And the biblical lens is that which enables us to have a right relational lens. And so that will be foundational throughout this time together. So let's start with the cultural lens. How did we get here is really the question we're asking. How did we get here? Now, when I say here, I mean that on several fronts. How did we get here from a trans-normalization of our culture? In 2014, you might remember a Time Magazine article, The Transgender Tipping Point. Its question at the time was whether America was ready to embrace trans persons into society. Now, just months after this article, Bruce Jenner, you guys remember Bruce Jenner, probably more famous for the Kardashians than he is for uh, being an Olympic uh, medalist, but uh, Bruce Jenner came out as Caitlyn Jenner just months later. And here we are in 2022, less than 10 years later, and I believe it's safe to say in America that we are well past the tipping point, whatever that might mean. The last few years, we've seen a warp speed normalization and exponential increase in individuals coming out in, as trans, which, by the way, is an umbrella term for a host of emerging non-binary and gendered fluid identities. Among American teens, we have a 329% generational increase in non-binary identities. The social phenomenon, primarily among teenage girls, called rapid onset gender dysphoria, is something that whole peer groups are now experiencing. This is particularly interesting coming out of the pandemic, how much this has changed and been on war- at warp speed. Entire peer groups coming out as not non- uh, non-binary identities, name changes, pronouns, and everything that comes with it. And no doubt this isn't just out there somewhere in the world. For many of us, this is personal. There's families, uh, likely here in this church, certainly is at my church, who are walking through this cultural whirlwind presently. When I say here, I'm not just talking about the cultural normalization. I'm also talking here medically. Do you know that uh, over the last 10 years, the medical and psychological uh, way to address gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria has completely shifted. Not often talked about, but completely shifted. The standard treatment for gender identity disorders are doctors now prescribing puberty blockers, cross-hormone therapy, and doing so at an earlier, earlier age, recommending uh, changing your biology, or at least your outward appearance of biology, to match your feelings versus where it was maybe 10 years before that was switched. And of course, the final uh, uh, stage in all of that is sexual reassignment surgery. So how did we get here medically? How did we get here politically? Oh boy, we, we don't have enough time to get into that one. How did we get here in schools? How did we get here on all of these fronts? Now, for some of us, it might feel like this happened overnight, like suddenly we sort of woke up and the world is like trans, you know? How in the world did that happen? It's not overnight. In fact, this is something that's happened over decades, I would argue over centuries in our culture, and we didn't even realize it. And so I would like to just take like five minutes or so to walk through some cultural history 
for us, okay? So just kind of get ready to go into a little bit of social history and philosophy for the next like five minutes or so, okay? I promise I won't be too long on that. I think it's really important to see the undercurrents that have converged over centuries to not only empower the LGBT plus movement, but also actually, listen, rewire our thinking about identity and self and sexuality and gender, And so, uh, let me give you three books. If this is something you're interested in studying on your own, three books I recommend, Strange New World by Carl Truman, excellent book. Uh, uh, Love Thy Body, Nancy Piercy, does a whole uh, treatment about the body-soul dynamic. Uh, And then Live No Lies by John Mark Comer, excellent book. Those are three that I encourage you, that will help, help you see the cultural dynamics that are in play. Okay, so here's kind of the thesis that I want to give you of how we got here culturally. Culture gender ideology comes from the domination of three increasingly accepted worldviews, the worldviews that converge and triumph, we might say, in our culture in America and particularly in the West, dualism, expressive individualism, and power theory, or Marxist power theory, okay? So let me just break that down for a moment. Let me talk about each one very briefly. Dualism, a very ancient understanding of dualism can be traced back to the mid-5th century B.C., ancient philosophy, popularized by the Greek philosophers. That's my, maybe what comes to your mind when you think of dualism. And here's essentially the, the, uh, the, the understanding of dualism. It is body and soul separation, Body and soul separation. Your soul, according to dualism, is your higher self. It is your real self. And your soul is defined as your inner self. We might say in our terms today, our psychological self. How we feel, how we think. Or maybe to put a Christianese kind of or religious spin on it, your spiritual self. Your body is your lower self. So this is two, kind of two floors of the house of self. The higher, upper, the better, the most important, the true self is the soul self. And your body is just essentially the lower self. It is, it's a wet machine. You can do whatever you want with it. It doesn't really matter. It is separate from your true you. And this is where we get modern mottos like, you can give your body but not your heart. Dualism is the underlying assumption that leads to the notion that you, can, you should block chemicals in your body. You should cross chemicals. You can change or remove parts of yourself as you deem fit because, after all, your body isn't your true self. You see where it comes from. This is dualism. The second is expressive individualism. Now, again, these are the, this is the cultural water that we swim in. It's the air we breathe without even recognizing it. Expressive individualism has been with us for a long time, and the Enlightenment is when it began to be popularized. Now, what is expressive uh, individualism? It is, uh, comes out of the Enlightenment. Uh, the, the background of this is prior to the Enlightenment of the 17th and 18th centuries, the, uh, your understanding of truth was a meta-narrative outside of yourself, a capital T truth, a sacred order of what is true, and you align yourself with that truth. That was the understanding. Expressive individualism, and particularly during the Enlightenment, was this idea of reversing that, that that truth is no longer up there somewhere. It's not a capital T truth, but rather truth is here. You don't look up, you look inside to find your lowercase t truth. What is true for you, your truth, right? That's a phrase we use all the time today as leading uh, sociologist Philip Reif uses this phrase, the psychological man who finds truth in his own sense of psychological well-being and feelings. And then he reorders his life, reorders his relationships, his identity, his purpose, even reordering society around his own truth. To describe where we are today, yeah? Out of the Enlightenment, we also get the notion that morality is useful to the degree that it produces personal happiness. 
See, morality is good if it makes me happy. Feeling good is being good. It's where we get our mottos today, you do you. We use that all the time, right? You do you. It's another version of expressive individualism. It's do whatever makes you happy. Saying the phrase, I'm not happy, is more important than asking what is true in our, today, in our world today. Professor Jonathan Grant writes about gender identity. Listen to what he says. Here's gender identity today. Modern authenticity grants us the right over our own beliefs and morality, the only rule being that they must resonate with who we feel we really are. The worst thing you can do is conform to a moral code that is imposed on us from outside, from society, parents, the church, or whoever else. The authentic self believes that personal meaning must come from ourselves or must resonate with our one-of-a-kind personality. When you hear that, does it sound familiar to what you're hearing and seeing out there in the world or experiencing even in yourself? This is expressive individualism. It's the cultural air that we breathe that shapes how we think about ourselves and life around us. The third that converges and triumphs in our society is what we might call power theory, or Marxist power theory is really the full title. Michel Foucault, Judith Butler during the sexual revolution of the 70s, thanks uh, mom and dad, uh, kind of came up with this idea, were some of the first to take Marxist notions of power theory from the world of economics and apply it to sex and gender norms. What do I mean by that? Well, this, this idea, that gender binaries, according to Marx's power theory, gender binaries, male, female, are an oppressive power tool. They're social constructs used by traditional and religious powers and societies to control and dominate the population. Equality there, we hear equality a lot today, for a power theorist, equality must mean of affirmation of all gender potential, potentials and the removal of morally oppressive norms. Listen to Judith Butler. She's a major proponent uh, in, in, in a more uh, recent history, major proponent of power theory applied to sexuality and gender. She says, I long for the days when gender distinctives finally disappear. This information is as irrelevant as the color of a child's eyes. Only then will men and women be socially interchangeable and really equal. And this is why it is not just enough to disagree with an LGBT plus ideology. That's not enough. It's not okay in our society. When power theory really takes uh, full uh, power in our society, a parent preventing or not supporting their child who wants to change genders or refusing to use preferred pronouns is considered an oppressive power play rather than a personal conviction. So this is, this is where we are and where we are heading as a society. I hope that's helpful, at least to get a little bit of the cultural water in which we are swimming in today. It's important to understand how we got here. Now, let's talk about the second piece, which is the biblical lens, really getting at the heart of the question that we're trying to ask about gender. What does God say, if anything, about this topic? Well, there's a few things I want to share. Number one, Here's what the, the Bible says, that the body is binary by design. Ones and zeros, male, female, created in the image of God. Created in the image of God. Genesis 1.27, listen to uh, the, the order. Listen to the, the, uh, the logic behind this. So God created mankind in his own what? Image. In the image of God, he created them. What image is that? What image is the image of God? Male and female. He created them. Now, at the risk of oversimplifying this conversation, we must kind of start here with this question. Do we believe God at his word? 
Do we believe that the Bible is authoritative in our lives, morally? It's not just a bunch of stories to inspire us. It's morally authoritative. We ought to abide by what it says about who we are. If the answer is yes, then friends, this, is, this issue is not a, well, you know, we can agree to disagree. This is kind of a gray area. You have your truth. I have mine. You know, we, we can kind of see it from different sides. It's not that from Scripture. It is very clear scripturally. The word image used here is used in Scripture to describe a physical copy or a representation of a non-physical being, which means, friends, that you and I represent on the planet the image of God. We represent, and therefore, if God is binary by nature, Male and female, it means that we are gender binary. Our male and female bodies are a key part of what makes us image bearers of God. And male and female bodies both uniquely bear the image of God and are called very good. Now, some might say that the, this is just in the Old Testament. Well, what about Jesus? What does Jesus have to say? After all, you know, we, we talk about Jesus. Does Jesus have anything to say about this? He does, actually. Jesus actually affirms a high view of the body, of the binary male-female construct. In Matthew 19, 4 and 5, he actually quotes this very passage that I just read from Genesis 1, 27. And he does so, friends, in a Roman society. And in that Roman society, it was very, very common to have gender-bending people in that society. Jesus was not ignorant of these issues. He stated this in the midst of a society that was blurring the lines of gender. Jesus agrees with Moses and the Old Testament. Jesus, by the way, or maybe better said, science agrees with Jesus and theology. Science will tell you very clearly, you cannot transition gender. Do you know there's no such thing as transitioning gender? Here's what you can do. You can move parts around, remove parts, add parts to your exterior body. You can even put chemicals in you or replace chemicals to make you feel like one gender or the other. But you cannot, science cannot change your chromosomes. XX, XY, it cannot be done. Realize the subject even when we say transgender, it is a, a non-starting term. So, number two, what does the Bible say? What does God say, if anything? Secondly, he says that the Bible says that our bodies are sacred and our bodies are interconnected with our soul. It's not this higher story, lower story. We are one connected being. In Paul's day, dualism was creeping into the church. And some began to believe that they were free to do whatever they wanted with their bodies, sex, eating, drinking, indulging in whatever they want, because after all, it's just the flesh. It's not who I truly am. And Paul corrects this. He says in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, the motto of the day in Corinth, I have the right to do anything, you might add, with my body. But Paul says not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything but not, I will not be mastered by anything, Paul corrects it. You, you have a saying in your culture that food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food and God will destroy them both. In other words, he's saying you can do whatever you want. You can eat whatever you want. You can do, have any kind of sexual relations you want because after all, it's just a wet machine. It's not connected to who I really am. But here's what Paul says. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Paul elevates the sacredness of the body, especially for Christ's followers. That means that what we do with our body affects our soul and our relationship to Christ. And this is why gluttony or deprivation, or self-harm, or sex outside of marriage, or pornography. These things aren't just sinful behaviors, but they will actually hinder you 
in your walk with Christ because our bodies and our souls work together. Together, Our bodies have a divine owner who designed them for his glory and his purposes. And so when we are immodest with our bodies or we hate our bodies, we dishonor God who made us in his image. When we manipulate, suppress, transition our bodies, we are acting as if we are the sovereign owner over our bodies, but the Bible clearly says we do not have the right over our bodies. God owns our bodies. He created them, and so we should worship God using our hearts, our souls, our bodies, our mind, our whole being. Number three, gender identity disorders have their roots in the fall. That is Genesis chapter 3. The original sin in Genesis 3, when mankind rebelled against his sacred order, against God and his, his law, they began, Adam and Eve began to experience for the first time disharmony and alienation. Disharmony and alienation in their bodies. Sam Alberry, a, a, a speaker, particularly on these issues, says, sin caused profound alienation, first and foremost from God, And we are also alienated from ourselves. What was meant to be whole and integrated, our mind, our body, and spirit spirit is now deeply fractured. We don't feel aligned in ourselves. And there's some people that experience that. They really experience, I I don't feel aligned in my own body. I feel off. I feel like uh, I'm somebody else and my body doesn't match that. That's that's real. That's not just kind of a made-up thing. Some people really experience that. Where does that come from? It's disordered from the very fall when harmony between body and soul and mind and God and creation and one another began to be fractured and disharmonized. And we live in the reverberation of the the fall, fallen nature and fallen nurture. People ask the question all the time, well, is, you know, is LGBT stuff, is this nature or is it nurture? The answer is yes. Because we live in a fallen world, we have fallen DNA, we have fallen minds, we have fallen nurture. So it might be your personal sin that led you to a place that doesn't honor God, but it might also be from the nature of living in a broken world or things that happened to you, trauma from your past. But today, if you take your child or your teen to see a gender specialist, it is very likely they will not ask the question, why do you hate your body? Why do you want to change your body? What is it? Are there things that happened to you in your past that have caused you to feel this way? What they will do, likely, is to rather jump to normalization and hormone therapy and everything else. Disorders have their their uh, place in the fall. Uh, Matthew 19, in Jesus' teaching on the binaries of man and woman, he hints at the reality of exceptions living in a fallen world. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus replies, not everyone can accept this word, but only to those whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who are born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who choose to live like a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. You say, what in the world is he talking about? A eunuch was a man who was in some way became maybe less than a man in sort of social standards. Maybe he was infertile or effeminate, or he was, he was castrated, or he was born with some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, something that affected his manhood, may we say that. In some way, he was deemed unmasculine. He was deemed by that society as other. Jesus addresses the eunuch here. Jesus understands, you know what? There is fallen nature. People, some are born like that, and there is fallen nurture. There are terrible things that people have done to mankind that have made people like that. Either way, God is sovereign over it. Jesus understands the realities of a Genesis 3 world. Number four, and this is related to the last point, that God can redeem what I call gender identity disorders or gender dysphoria. He can do so for his glory. Matthew 9, 12, here's what Jesus says. There are those who choose to live like eunuchs 
for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, the one who can accept this should accept this. You guys, you guys just hear what Jesus said? He's saying there are some people who might not fit neatly into the social, the social ideas of what male and female are or supposed to be like, maybe because of things that happened to them, maybe because of their, their, just their deformities, whatever went down. Some are choosing to live as if they are a eunuch for the glory of God. Meaning, it is possible to place our condition in the hands of God. Saying, God, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm, I'm built like a boy, but I feel like a girl. Or I, I, I'm built like a girl, but I feel like a boy. Or whatever it might be. It is possible to take that condition in the hands of God, and he can redeem it for his glorious purposes, both now and the kingdom to come. John Tyson, Pastor John, says, we live in a Genesis 3 world with a Genesis 1 blueprint that's moving toward a Revelation 21 eternity where God is going to redeem all things. Take, for example, Walt Heyer. Walt, uh, at age 45, went to go see a gender therapist who told him that his feelings of gender dysphoria could be resolved if he transitions to living like a woman. And so he did. Walt transitioned fully to living as if he was a woman. He called himself by Laura. And soon, after a couple of years, he began to realize that it didn't fix his problems. It didn't fix his dysphoria. It didn't fix his depression and his self-hatred. And eventually, it led this broken man into a friendship with a Christian pastor. After two years of meeting, Walt gave his life to Christ. And he began a process of healing from his repressed childhood wounds. He began to detransition back to a man to living as Walt. And now he has an incredible ministry over the last couple of decades, ministering to people that are in a very similar situation to him. Only God can make a story like that. Only God can you take your deep, deep brokenness and put it in the hands of God and he can redeem it for his glory. Do you guys believe that? God can redeem even the deepest dysfunctions of our heart and soul. That you can clap for. <laughs> finally, finally, and I know uh, this, is, this is going a little long, so I'll, I'll try to compress it here. Um, let's look at the relational lens briefly. In other words, how do we respond, particularly how do we respond in love to those who have non-binary feelings or gender identity disorder or consider themselves trans. And many struggle with this. In, a church, in the church I pastor in Delaware, I'm connected personally to four people ranging between 14 and 27 who grew up in our church who now consider themselves trans. I lead a small group of families of LGBT plus persons. About 15 or so come out weekly to that small group to talk, how do we parent in this? How do we influence our kids? How do we love them and, and yet hold to truth? What do we do about their new name or wanting to buy a binder or their pronouns? What do we do? This is not just out there, friends. This is, this is here. You have friends, likely you have family members, you have coworkers that you know. So what do you do? So I'm listen to Pastor Nate's sermon? Maybe, but what do you do? Let's talk about that. Two faulty approaches in the church today. Some have all the conviction in the world, but no compassion. Friends, that is not the way of Jesus. That's the way of the Pharisee. That's the way of the Pharisee. And friends, if you, when you think about these topics, you get really angry or you try to win an argument or you try to become a social media warrior as your first impulse, Friends, you've got to address that Phariseeism that dwells in our hearts. And it dwells in my heart too. I have to face it all the time. The other false way of going about this, the, the error that we see in the church, is all the compassion in the world with no conviction. It's I want to love, I want to embrace, I don't want to judge. After all, Jesus, you know, protected that woman uh, that, that was caught in, in, in adultery. And he told all those other people to stop judging her. Yes, that's true. And do you remember the conversation he had with her personally? Now go leave your life of sin. 
friends. It's both and. The way of Jesus is both and. It's compassion and conviction. It is the way of the gospel. We must see trans people through the eyes of Jesus, made in the image of God. Not someone to avoid, not some person representing a political ideology, not as some kind of argument to win, but as a person created in the image of God, as a glorious mess, just like you. Each of us are a glorious mess. We have the capacity of glory because we're created in the image of God, and yet we're a mess. The line between good and bad runs down the center of every human heart. Friends, we must, in order to see people in the eyes and through the eyes of Jesus, we must first and foremost be praying for, be desiring that that individual has an encounter with Jesus as Lord. Has an encounter with Jesus as Lord. God is not first and foremost most concerned with your gender or your sexuality. Just like he's not first and foremost concerned about whether you struggle with greed or pride or materialism. He is, but his goal is that you see your brokenness and your utter inability to find salvation for your, on your own and to come to him open-handed with your life and find new life in a relationship with Jesus. Experience that unconditional love that every single human heart was made for. Friends, that's the invitation for every one of us. Whether it's this issue or you're struggling with something else that you feel like other. You feel like maybe I don't belong here because I'm not like one of them. I don't have my life together. I'm not perfect. Friends, those are the very conditions in which you meet Jesus. That was me. I entered a relationship with Christ when I was sexually promiscuous, misogynistic, porn addict. That was me. And some Christian loved me enough to bring me with them to experience an encounter with God. Not trying to fix me and saying, oh, your your moral life is way off. You need to start doing this, this, and this. No, he said, come meet Jesus. I want you to know this Jesus of mine. And an encounter with Jesus is when I began to be changed, not by moral uh, enforced structures into my life, but rather through love of Jesus, surrendering more and more of my heart from the inside out. And that's the work of Jesus. He is still in the business of transforming lives. Amen? He's still in the business of transforming lives. Hopefully you're out there and you are living proof of that truth. Now friend, let me just challenge you. If you are here today and you're not sure about gender or sexuality or whatever, and it doesn't align with what the Bible says, and you're trying to follow Jesus and also do your own thing. Can I just challenge you with the loving words, the hard words, but the loving words of the Apostle Paul in Scripture, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, his incredible gospel saving you, offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to the Lord. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Every single one of us are being discipled. Do you know that? Every single one of us are being discipled and you can either be discipled by Jesus or you can be discipled by culture. But every one of us are being discipled. Every one of us are being, uh, the world is trying to fit us into their pattern, into their mold. And here's the culture's discipleship process for somebody who's questioning their gender. Detach your body from the authentic you. Identify your authentic self based on your feelings. Believe that changing identity will solve your problems. Socially transition and celebrate your identity through your appearance, name, and your pronouns. Disassociate from anyone who does not fully embrace your new identity. Utilize cross-hormone therapy to take the appearance and feelings of your desired gender and complete your transition through sexual reassignment surgery. That is the discipleship 
pathway of the culture. Make no mistake about it. That's where it's going. Discipleship to Christ, for those that are experiencing gender disorder, here's what it looks like. It's the narrow way. Believe that your body is sacred and made in the image of God. Identify your authentic self in Christ. Work through aligning your body, your soul, and your mind according to design, not desire. Seek help in honest community and counseling with other Christians. Open up your life to the struggle with other people. It's okay not to be okay. And we want to help you not stay that way. Number five, offer your body to Christ as an act of worship. In that great movie, Toy Story. You guys Toy Story fans? Remember, Woody is lost in the world. He lost his identity. He lost his purpose until he looks at the bottom of his boot. You remember what he sees? Andy. And he realizes who he is. Friends, we are lost in this world. We are confused. We are wandering until we realize who we are. If you know Jesus, you are bought by him. He owns you. And he defines you. I pray that that would be true for you today. Let's pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you for making us and how we are. I pray that if there's anyone here today that just hates their body, feels out of alignment, not sure what they are, who they are, Lord, that they would sort of look at the bottom of their shoe. They would look up to you and see the beauty of your design. More than anything, I pray that all of us would have an encounter with you. We might give our lives over to you, that you might transform us from the inside out. Give us wisdom, give us compassion, but also give us conviction pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, You can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.